Welcome everyone to Ask the Pastor. I am your host, Blake Gideon, Senior Pastor of the First Baptist Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. Uh, again, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate all of our subscribers and those who share and encourage others to listen. We have uh, several questions for today. Um, I've read through them. I'll be honest, uh, I'm, I'm confused by some of them, and uh, but I'll do my best to try to answer. Uh, my first question is this. In Isaiah 7, 14, it tells of Jesus coming, but it also describes more like John the Baptist. How is this separated only to Jesus? And by the way, I want you to know when I read these questions, I'm reading them exactly the way they were presented to me. Okay, and so uh, uh, now this one's not that hard to answer, but you're going to see when I start answering some of these questions, it's hard for me to answer them. Uh, because of the way they are written, okay? So I'm going to read them to you exactly the way they come to me. Now, let me read this one again. In Isaiah 7, 14, it tells us of Jesus coming, but it also describes more like John the Baptist. How is this separated to only Jesus? Now, here's the verse. Therefore, the Lord himself will give a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Um, the person says, well, this, is, this seems to describe John the Baptist more than it does Jesus. Well, I would disagree with that. For, first of all, John the Baptist was not born of a virgin. Um, his, his, his mother, Elizabeth, had sex with her husband. And, um, and so uh, Elizabeth was not a virgin, okay? This, this verse says, Therefore the Lord himself will give a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. So this passage can't be about John the Baptist uh, because he was not born of a virgin. Only Jesus was. So obviously this passage is only speaking about Jesus. There's only been, there's only been one man who's ever been born of a virgin, and that's, and that's the God-man, Jesus Christ. And not only this, it says the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Well, Emmanuel, Emmanuel means God with us. Well, John the Baptist was not God. Uh, he was not called Emmanuel. Only Jesus was. God with us is what literally what Emmanuel, Emmanuel means. And so this passage of Scripture, Isaiah 7, 14, cannot at all be referring to John the Baptist. It can only refer to Jesus. Jesus is the only one born of a virgin, and Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us, not John the Baptist. I do appreciate your question, and I do believe I have answered that question. Now, this second question I have, I'll be honest with you, is a little bit lengthy, um, but let me read it. Uh, this person writes, I'm in the middle of reading a Christian fiction book entitled Every Crooked Path, by Stephen James. I've never read the book. I don't read Christian fiction. Um, this is not a rebuke against anyone who does. Um, it, it's just not a genre of, a book, of writing that I, that I prefer to read. Uh, and so I'm, not, I'm really not familiar with any Christian fiction. Um, but this is not a rebuke. Just a, it's just a statement. So this person says that in this book, at one point it talks about the passage from James 1, 13, 15, which talks about the pedigree of trials. A character in the book says this passage is basically saying that people are tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. After those desires have conceived, they give birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. In other words, what is conceived in evil develops into sin and eventually gives birth to death. One person says you can step out of the cycle any time, but the longer you let evil desires lead you around, the stronger those chains become. Another person says we are born with chains and it takes more than just a concerted effort on our part to shrug them off. The question is raised, 
How much do we need God to break us free from our own evil desires? And how much responsibility do we have for doing it on our own? Okay, well, I, 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 of course, I, I'm going to answer this according to the Bible. Uh, let me read the verse that, the, that, uh, that you've cited here. The verse is from James chapter 1. And here's the verse, uh, verse 13, James 1, 13. It says, uh, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, give birth, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. First of all, let me just tell you what this passage is talking about. This passage says we cannot blame God for our sin is what the is what the the passage is teaching us. Don't blame God when you sin. You sin because of your own desire. So here here's the pedigree or if you will. Uh, desire evil desire is the result of our own sin nature. Okay? Evil desire is the result of our own sin nature. And when we give in to that evil desire, we sin. And we sin because we're born sinful. And as a result of that sin, there's death. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we're all born with a sin nature. Therefore, we all have evil desire. And when we give in to evil desire, we give in to our sin nature. And the result of sin is death. You ask the question, how much do we need God to break this cycle? Well, we, I, it, we need God so bad that we can't break it ourselves. <laughs> we can't break the cycle of sin ourselves. Only God can. And so that's the reason that we all need to trust in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It doesn't matter how good our efforts are, how good our intentions. Uh, there's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to save ourselves uh, from the consequence of sin, which is eternal death and hell, separation from God. The Bible says, but God demonstrated his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so from a salvation standpoint we need god totally because there's no good in us there's none who seek after god no not one we are dead in our trespasses and sin apart from christ so um, salvation is solely a work of god in our hearts by grace his spirit does the work of, reg of regeneration apart from god a person will never be saved we need God totally, okay? Now, let me assume that your question is, is really in relation to a, to a person who's already saved. Well, it's true that when we, are still, when we are saved, we still struggle with that Adamic sin nature. And uh, an evil desire uh, still takes up resident in our heart, even though we have dominion now over evil desire. At the moment of salvation, evil desire no longer has reign in your life. You have dominion over evil desire uh, through a personal re relationship with Jesus Christ, through the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit. But there are times when we do give in to evil desire, and, and as a result, we sin against God. And the longer we remain in that sin cycle, yeah, there will be death. It could be God's discipline um, that results in death. Or it could be that a person proves they never were genuinely saved to begin with. Um, and as a result of that, it's spiritual death, the second death, death and hell. Um, again, we need God totally. You cannot break the sin cycle in and of yourself. Now, do we as Christians have responsibilities? Absolutely. It's not let go and let God. Um, we have a responsibility to grow in our relationship with God. We have a responsibility to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, but realizing that it's God who is at work in us to do and 
uh, to do and to will according to His good pleasure. Uh, we have a responsibility to, to repent of sin and to pursue holiness, to forsake the things that are dishonoring to God. The, the author of Hebrews said that we are to throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles and we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. So when it relates to salvation, it's totally a work of God. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. But as it relates to the Christian, of course we have responsibility. It, we can't do it apart from God, okay? So um, I would say that, you know, I don't want to get into the, to the, to the uh, Christian fiction aspect of what was written. What I shared with you is what the Bible teaches. And, uh, and so I, I hope that that, uh, that answer, answers your question. For the Christian, the spiritual disciplines are essential to helping us overcome sinful habits. Scripture reading, prayer, journaling, fasting, praying. All these things are necessary not only to know God, but to break sinful patterns in our lives. And we cannot do this apart from a healthy relationship with God. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Um, the last question, well, really the next question I have for today, and, and this is the question that has stumped me, okay? Not because I don't believe I can answer it, but it's, it's the way it's written. I'm not sure that I understand the question. So let me read it to you. This person says, I was raised in a different theological background. Christian, but not once saved, always saved theology. And by the way, can I, can I just say that I've, I don't say that? I don't say once saved, always saved. This person's going to attribute that statement to me here in a moment, but I don't use that statement. OK, at all. It's a cliche. I don't I don't use that statement. I've never I've never said that statement. Um, I've never liked that statement. So please don't attribute that statement to me when I when I don't even like it myself. So uh, this person says I was raised in a different theolo theological background, Christian, but not once saved, always saved theology. This person says I've listened and read and studied trying to figure out what Scripture actually teaches. My struggle is, if we are all born to do what we will do, where is the hope of Christ in that? And so I'm not sure I understand that question. If we're all born to do what we will do, what, you know, where is the hope of Christ in that? What does that have to do with once saved, always saved? I, I'm not sure that I understand the thought process. This person goes on to say, a dear friend of mine believes your theology wholeheartedly. Okay, what theology are you referring to? He believes my theology? Well, let me just say this. I don't have my theology. I don't have my own theology. I, I, have, I, have what, I believe what the Bible teaches. So I'm not sure what you mean by your friend believes my theology uh, wholeheartedly and feels that their life is destined to be the rod of God's anger uh, I, I'm not sure what your friend believes. I can't, I, I, I'm not sure. You go on to say the last few years have been difficult and, a, and full of struggle for this friend. Um, this statement and thought leaves people frustrated without the hope of our risen Lord and Savior. What statement? Once saved, always saved? That statement? Well, I don't use that statement. So, um, what statement are you referring to? That statement? If, if so, how does, how does that leave them without hope? It seems like you've got several things in your mind, but, but you're not clearly articulating what they are. So I'm having, I'm having a hard time answering this question. You go on to say, I don't know enough about the Bible or theology to shed light on the truth of Scripture. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That helps me uh, to understand what you might be getting to. Other than the obvious, I cannot believe that God calls us to him and saves us from our sin to leave us in a place of despair and without hope. Well, I don't believe that either. I agree with you. I don't believe that either. How do I help my friend in love and, and truth of the cross out of the lie of the, and out of the lie of the pit of despair? Okay, thank you for your question. And I do appreciate that you said 
that you don't know enough about the Bible or theology to be able to help them. Because that, le that lets me know that you're probably, uh, you know, not, and I don't mean this in a, in a mean way at all, but you're a younger Christian, you're a young Christian, you're an immature Christian. And, uh, and so I, I can, that's going to help me to be able to, to answer this question. There's several statements that you made in this question that are presumptions. They're presumptions on myself and what I believe. And uh, your presumptions are not accurate. To, to say that my theology is once saved, always saved, um, when, I, when I don't even use that statement. I don't even like that statement. I think it's a cliche. I don't think it's a biblical statement. Okay? So uh, don't attribute that to me. Don't, don't say that that's my theology. Uh, I don't know that we've ever taught. I'm not sure who you are. but uh, And I don't know if your friend told you I believe that, but I've never said that. So... And then, um, um, and I'm not sure what you mean by um, if people are destined to do what they will do, what, what hope is there in that? I'm not sure what you mean by if people are destined to do what they will do. I'm not sure about what you mean by that statement, and I'm not sure how that ties into your question about once saved, always saved. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to, 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 to just decipher what I think you may be feeling, okay? Let me tell you what I believe about salvation, because ultimately all these questions that you have and about your friend have to do with salvation. Um, I believe that every person is born sinful. And because of that, we're born lost. We're born separated from God. And I believe that there's nothing in and of ourselves that we can do to earn God's favor. Um, the Bible says that, uh, that there's, uh, for salvation is by grace through faith, not by works. It's not of yourself, lest anybody should boast. Romans chapter 3 says there's none good, there's no not one, there's none who seek after God. Ephesians 2 says that we're all dead in our trespasses and sin. And as a result, we are, we are destined to wrath. And so I believe that every poor person is born sinful, condemned, and destined for wrath. That's what I believe. And I also believe that if a person is going to be saved they have to trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. They have to admit their sin, repent of sin, and trust in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I believe that faith and repentance go hand in hand. Okay? Faith and repentance are by grace. They're, they, they are by grace, and God gives them to us as a gift, and then we have a responsibility to trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's what I believe. And I believe if a person is truly saved, then their salvation is eternally secure. So I do believe in eternal security. But I do not like the phrase, once saved, always saved. Because a lot of people claim to be saved and they're not. They're not. They're just not. But I do believe if somebody is, is truly saved, then their salvation is eternally secure in Jesus. And I can give you ample evidence in Scripture. Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish. Listen to that. Will not perish. If you believe in Jesus, you trust Him as your Lord and Savior, you will not perish. But have everlasting life. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I know my sheep, they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter, Romans chapter uh, 8 that there is nothing or no one that can separate us from the love of God in Christ. So in Christ, our salvation is eternally secure. And those who are truly saved... We'll live for the Lord. 
It's those who persevere to the end that will be saved. Our faith is made evidence by our works. So if someone is truly born again, which is evident by the life that they live, then their salvation is eternally secure. Okay? I do not believe that someone can claim to be a Christian and live however they want. I do not believe that. I do not believe that you can say, well, I'm saved and, and then keep living in sin. I do not believe that. I do. If you believe that, then I believe you never have been saved. Therefore, you have no security of your salvation. That's what I believe. But I believe if you're truly born again, which is evidenced by your works, then your salvation is eternally secure in Jesus. That's what I believe. Okay. I'm not sure what you mean by your question. If we're destined to do what we will do, where's hope in that? I don't know if you're referring to predestination. And then I'm not sure how that connects to your question about once saved, always saved. Um, I, I, predestination and election is a whole other issue. I, I've done tons of que ask the pastors on that. I would encourage you to go back and listen to some of my other ask the pastors. But uh, I would say to your friend, who believes that he's destined to be the rod of God's anger, um, well, I would say that uh, if he doesn't want to be the, the instrument of God's anger, then he should repent or she should repent and trust in Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? If, if they don't want to be the instrument of God's wrath, then trust in Christ. Turn from sin. Run to Jesus and be saved. And if you do, then your salvation is eternally secure in Christ if indeed you have been born again. I would say to your friend that uh, um, if, he doesn't want, if he doesn't want to be destined for hell, if she doesn't want to be destined for hell, then run to Jesus. <laughs> Trust in Jesus. Surrender your life to Jesus. Uh, that's what I believe. Okay, so I hope that, I hope that answers your question. All right. Um. Last question. This person says, I was recently reading an article criticizing popular Bible teachers that each, Christ, uh, that each Christians, let me read it again. I was recently reading an article crit criticizing popular Bible teachers that teach Christians about contemplative prayer. What is a contemplative prayer and is it false teaching? Well, contemplative prayer is simply... Um, I, I believe that, I don't know what they were teaching, but here's what I believe contemplating prayer is. First of all, I encourage it. I don't, I don't believe, it. if it's taught right, it's not false teaching. Contemplative prayer is just simply listening to God. So often we just run to God in prayer and we, and we, and we start just babbling on, and, and, and I don't mean that to be criticized, but so often when we pray, uh, we just talk, 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 ask, 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 intercede, intercede, intercede. And we never stop and listen. We never think about what God has to say. And contemplative prayer is simply stopping and listening to God. Thinking about, in your prayer, thinking about what God's Word says. Contemplating God's Word. Contemplating what God's answer is to your prayer according to His Word. And so... If, I don't know what you heard about contemplative prayer, but I encourage contemplative prayer. And if it's and if it's and if it's like I just told you, then I don't think it's false teaching. So thank you for your questions. Um, I do appreciate them very much. When you submit your questions, think about me reading them. And, and so read through it yourself and make sure that it that it's easy to understand. So I want to do the best job that I can to answer your questions, but, but, they, but they need to be written in a way that where, where I, when I read them, I, I truly understand what your question is. So if you can help me in that, I would greatly appreciate it. God bless you. Keep tuning in to Ask the Pastor. Um, see you next week.